Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Direct Specialty Care Alliance webinars. We are very fortunate and very honored to have today Nicole Harkin, which I know for about three years. Nicole is a board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, and clinical lipidology. And after graduating um, from Boston University School of Medicine, she attended the uh, residency, internal medicine residency at Columbia University, followed by a cardiology fellowship at New York University. As an assistant attending uh, in NYU until she moved to San Francisco. When was that, Nicole? When was it? We moved to San Francisco in uh, the summer of 2020. I see. About the same time I'm <laughs> and I think the same when you moved, right? Yeah. Yes, we moved about the same time in the in the area. But before um, we start, I want to tell you that Nicole is passionate and um, she is a huge advocate about preventing and treating heart diseases through sustainable lifestyle changes. She works with her patients to create a proactive and personalized cardiac care plan. She's also involved in the health tech industry. Uh, she is the chief medical advisor for Plate Up. This is a startup dedicated to improving health through nutrition. And she's also part of committees such as American Society for Preventive Cardiology Nutrition and for American College of Cardiology, California Chapter Prevention Committee. Nicole, welcome. I'm very, thank very happy to that. have you here. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, that introduction. I appreciate it. I know that you are practicing direct care for the last three years, and I would like you to tell us how did you discover direct care? Because I believe that uh, where you train, I don't think they uh, they mentioned direct care to you, correct? No, absolutely not. And I think like most docs, as you're going through training, you really mostly see academic doctors and, and you don't really even get that much exposure to private practice, let alone an out of network sort of direct care style of practice. So um, I had practiced. So after I finished fellowship, I was at an NYU affiliated private practice, um, and, which was a very typical private practice. Um, and I was there for, I practiced in a traditional sort of cardiology practice for about five years. Um, very typical 30 plus patients a day, not a lot of time to discuss, uh, prevention, which was really my, my passion and always has been. Um, I worked very closely with the prevention group at NYU during my fellowship. And that's always been what I've been really interested in and specifically, from a lifestyle medicine perspective. And as anyone who's ever tried to work with their patients on behavior change, it takes more than the 10, 15 minutes allotted in an insurance-based visit. And so the practice I was at was, was great in terms of it really supported my goals of wanting to build out a prevention group. I had actually just hired a nutritionist and an exercise physiologist to support my work in behavior change and lifestyle medicine and preventive cardiology. Uh, so we actually left Left New York for my husband's job. So it was, was unrelated to sort of my professional goals, but it did when we did move and it was deep in the middle of the pandemic, I had just had a third kid. So I took finally some time off. It was like my first real maternity leave. Um, and so I took about six months off and just kind of intentionally, just didn't do anything Did zoom kindergarten with my eldest, et cetera, et cetera. And then during that time started really kind of doing a lot of introspective work. What is it I want to do? Everyone sort of assumed I was going to go apply for UCSF or where wherever or Kaiser. Um, and I really just knew in my gut that that wasn't what I wanted to do, but I didn't know what, what it was. And I started looking for private practices that potentially I could join. Um, and there aren't any, uh, there really are like no private practices. Um, and so, uh, so then I was like, well, I guess maybe I can create my own, but it all sound, sound very daunting. And I also knew the insurance model just wasn't a great model for me. And I really think it was through some of these doctor Facebook groups and you, where I sort of first heard about this concept of direct care and not being within the insurance network. And I was like, well, 
wait, that sounds perfect in terms of my niche and what it is I want to do. I want to spend an hour with my patient. I can't do that in the insurance-based model. Um, so, so that's when I started exploring that. And then just like many of you started just asking lots of questions, talking to lots of people and starting to try to understand both the nuts and bolts of the basics of how you even start a company, what's required from that perspective, um, starting to kind of build out a, a social media network and uh, presence um, and then, and then starting to kind of craft, what are my offerings? What's the price point? What, how is this all going to look? Um, and it's a work in progress and there's, it's been, there's definitely been an evolution, um, in terms of how the practice is going. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, continuing to build, um, it's thriving at this point and it's been, it's been quite a journey. So anyway, so thank you <laughs> first and foremost for introducing me to this mo model. And then also just being supportive of everyone who's looking to go into this type of model and helping them know that there's another way to do it should they want to pursue that. Thank you. Because you mentioned the work that you had and the connection through social media. If, um, if people here do not know about that, you are uh, very famous on social media. <laughs> far, far from it. I do have a decent sized following. I think I have something close to 80,000 followers on Instagram at this point. Um, and I, 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 I don't love doing social media. I know it might, hopefully it seems like I do. It's not, it doesn't come super naturally to me, but I do love patient education. I've always loved that part. That was always been my favorite about, you know, seeing how you can impart knowledge and work with people to, to sort of understand what's going on. I mean, half of what, why people come to see me is because they can sit down with me for an hour and ask all their questions and know they're going to leave that visit totally understanding what's going on, what's our goals, what can they do, concrete plan, et cetera. And so even though I can't obviously do that for, you know, I can only do, treat so many people in my practice. I do love that, that social media gives me that opportunity to sort of provide education to people who don't have access to a preventive cardiologist. I get DMs and emails literally daily from people saying, oh my gosh, this has been life-changing. This has been so helpful. I'm so glad that like, even though I can't be your patient, I love that I can like hear your knowledge. Um, so that's great. I would say, obviously from a private practice perspective, everyone, you have to have a social media presence at this point, like it's required. Um, so obviously from a business perspective, both to acquire new patients, um, but also most importantly, to allow your current patients to get to know you better and to have an understanding of, of the things that you talk about off, outside of your appointments. Because even though my appointments are an hour, there's still only so much you can do, right? And so I love that my patients come in. One, half of them walk in after they've been referred to me by another doctor, but then they have seen my social media. They come and they're like, I feel like I already know you. Let's get started. And so that's a great yes. place really, you know, that's, it's a phenomenal place to be because they trust me already. They know what I'm going to say. They're like, you look just like you do on Instagram and you talk the same way. And like, they feel like they already know you, which is great. And then half of my old patients, they'll ping me. They're like, oh, I just saw that message. Like, can you tell me more about that? Or I want to make sure we talk about that at our appointment or whatever. So they're getting a lot of education in between my visits as well. Um, so, so I really like that. When you started your practice, were you already on social media or you kind of show up on social media after or as, a, as an effort to build up the awareness about your practice? Exactly. I had I had been on Instagram just as a, for personal reasons with my friends and sharing pictures of my babies and things like that. Um, and it wasn't until I moved to San Francisco, I think it was like the fall, late fall, winter air of 2020 when I started my professional account. And actually at first I did it more just because um, I was not working at the time and I had some extra time and, you know, I love to cook and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, the very least I should start some professional account, put myself out there, et cetera. And it wasn't until kind of 2021 where I was like, oh, this is actually important from a business perspective to really be building this. And then honestly, the last thing I forgot to mention about social media that I love is the number of physicians I've connected with over Instagram. I mean, that's crazy, but it is such a great way to network. And then 
doctors who I don't know here in, in California, they see my content. They were patients to me because of that too. So it's not just patients that are seeing you. And then, um, you know, different docs that are in lifestyle medicine or preventive care have connected with me as well. And so I've formed these like networks, um, which, you know, is, is just crazy. It's really cool that you get to know so many people that way. When you um, think about social media as a way for you to advertise, do you have a plan? Do you make a plan? Do you update the plan? How do you do it? Because I think so, many people will be interested to hear about that. Yeah, I should be more structured about it, but I am not. Um, I'm pretty haphazard about it, but I do think having some sort of structure plan is probably a better way to go than I do. But I will definitely say that I, I think about the type of content that I'm putting out there what and what I've noticed that converts better versus not. And I think it's, it's good to have a mixture of different types of content. I try very hard not to be salesy. It's not in my, I, I literally never am like, come see me at my practice. Like that's not my vibe. Some people do it. I think it works probably well. Um, it's just not my vibe. So I try to put out educational content that is, is helpful, but also um, I have noticed that if I, I like content that's done really well and converted really well is stuff where I'm providing education, but I'm giving people like, for instance, this is a way this, if you're my patient, this is the kind of stuff I talk about. And so if I even just framing it as like a, these are the different cardiovascular risk factor buckets that I think about when I'm working with my patients, people are, like, oh, that's cool. I want to be a patient, right? So framing the, the education in a way where you're talking about you doctoring is great. People also love to have, and I and I don't do a lot of this because I'm pretty private, but people do like to see day in the lives and like, you know, get to know you as a human being and as a person. So people really respond well to that as also. Um, and I think the more you share, the better as well. Um, and then, you know, just thinking about different types. So, so personal sort of content, get to know me. This is, and then a lot of like doctory content, like they love to see you know, me in my office doing silly videos, um, some of the trending sounds and things like that um, can be helpful, not doing that exclusively because it gets bad, but, you know, doing some of the different trends. I mean, actually the, the trend that blew up the most for me was the one where it was like, it wasn't a trending sound, but it was a trending sort of uh, uh, genre in which you were talking about the five things as an X, my job X, I wouldn't do. So mine was, you know, five things as a cardiologist, I would never do. And that one blew up. Um, so, so thinking and looking at the trends and doing some of those as well, um, can every now and then do really well too. Are you following certain people and trying to uh, follow the trends of what they do for certain doctors that are um, on Instagram? And yeah. maybe you can give us some names because people would like to learn from them yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that. So I spend a lot less time on Instagram than I used to, um, and I'm pretty pretty business oriented at this point, and just go in and go out. But if you're just starting your account, I think you know following doctors that obviously just have very large followings is important, regardless of what type of doctor they are, but then thinking about, um, other docs that have larger following specifically that are in your, your niche are really important to follow. Um, yes. and, and, and so I did a lot of that at first and, and then you interact with all their content. So trying to interact with all of their content so that, um, not only they see it, but then more importantly, their followers see it, um, and try to add value in your comments and things like that. And then people will kind of discover you that way. Eventually, you know, trying to, once you have a building up a following, trying to do Instagram lives with other people that are, have maybe larger following than you, um, that are also in your niche as well can be great. And then you can start doing collaborative posts and things like that. So for instance, I do a lot of lifestyle medicine education, obviously specifically geared towards cardiometabolic health. And so I interact with a lot of lifestyle oriented docs on, on social and try to do Instagram lives and things like that, but I've expanded since then. And so now it's like, you know, interacting with someone who like a guy and let's talk about women's health, specifically cardiometabolic health and stuff like that. So there's different ways that you can collaborate and you'd be surprised where you can find kind of connections. Um, and then every touch point you do like that is just, you know, getting yourself out there. And then it just takes time. It takes a lot of time, um, both <laughs> commitment to it and just being regular and posting, but then also, um, you know, just, it, and there's cyclical trends and the algorithms always changing. So just being patient, continuing to put out good content, making relationships, and eventually, you know, things, things definitely pick up and grow. 
Good. I know that uh, we have so many questions related to marketing through social medias, but uh, social media platforms, because um, different people are the, on different platforms. But let's go back to the point where you started. And um, because there are people that might be at the beginning, and they think about the challenges that they have ahead, what was the biggest challenge that you have, or you had when you started? I think there's a lot. <laughs> Where do I begin? No, I mean, so first and foremost, I think just in the beginning, it was like, how do I even begin to think about building a business? Like, I am a doctor. I have never been exposed to, I'm not business minded. I don't even know how you begin to create. So finding the right people who can help give you that framework and that structure. And I know there's a lot of people in the direct specialty alliance now that are offering sort of, you know, consultations and things like that. Find the people that are already doing this and you know, sit down with them for an hour or a couple hours or whatever it is and learn from them because you don't want to try to recreate the wheel. And I think when you and I first started, we kind of were creating, but there wasn't many Correct. people doing it. No. And so we were just pulling piecemeal and getting information from different people. And that's, that's a more, much more onerous way to do it. Um, whether, cause there's now enough people I think that are already doing this. Right. And so pick their brains, figure out what they've done and just, you know, do it. Like, do you need a lawyer right away? Do you need a CPA right away? How do you create the business? What's the best EMRs? You know, all those stupid nuts and bolts. Like you don't want to waste your time doing that because we did Correct. and it took forever. Um, so, so that part I think was very time consuming and I wish there had been a better kind of shortcut for, for me at that point, because I, I feel like I wasted a lot of time thinking about that sort of stuff that now doesn't matter. What really matters is what's my niche? What's my offering? How am I creating value? How am I different from an insurance-based practice? How am I going to market myself and find patients? Think about that very early. Um, and what's kind of the structure and the program and the protocol and all that kind of stuff. Cause that, and like, what, what type of services are, am I offering? And really thinking through that stuff, thinking about your price point is really important. I really undervalued myself in the beginning. <laughs> I <think> all did. <laughs> um, and so, because you don't know what you're doing. And so figuring out, so now, again, there's enough people now that are doing this, figure out what all of us are charging and figure out your market and figure out what your overhead is. Cause that's going to look different for you too. So I think doing kind of that market research about your specific area and your niche and all that is way more important than all the silly like nuts and bolts that someone can just like give you a playbook and you can do it. Thank you for mentioning that. This is very true. When we started, there was no information available. There was no resources. There were no people to help us. We were helping each other with information and we were supporting each other. If you remember, we put our names on a flyer and we started to distribute the flyer to people in the community. So we yeah. tried to help each other because we didn't know how to spread the word uh, to to let the people know that we are there, we are available, and we are doing great care. So um, that's why you know, about a year and a half ago, I started the Direct Specialty Care Alliance to kind of build that framework for people. And we have a, an online course and we have resources and we are there to help each other. And we have a map where we put our names for patients to find us, employers to find us and other doctors to find us. And that is uh, crucial for our community to grow and to support each other. Now, because you mentioned prices and undervaluing ourselves, this is a problem that every single doctor in direct care has. And I have to share with you that I was invited to give a talk uh, to the um, California rheumatology uh, um, community here. And one of the critics was about undervaluing my services. And I would like you to tell us, how did you thought about your prices and how do you think about prices or pricing your services at this point? And if you can disclose the price of your consultations. Happy to, happy to. So um, I think a lot of it goes back to having a very clear business plan and a very clear understanding of how much you want to make and how much it costs to run a business. And I think I grossly underestimated how much it it costs to run a business in San Francisco, California, um, which has 
the highest cost of living in the entire country. I also, my business model changed. Um, and so I think part of it wasn't entirely, you know, my lack of understanding. I really did try to put together, you know, a spreadsheet of expenses and all this stuff and tried to price myself accordingly. Um, but I think I, I underestimated a couple of things. One, um, how expensive it would be to run my business. I also went from sort of a virtual only model. Um, and we can mm -hmm. talk about but it was deep COVID and I thought I was just going to try to start telemedicine. I found it very personally, very difficult to grow as a telemedicine only practice. That was my experience. It might not be everybody's. Um, and so switched once I felt kind of more comfortable to a hybrid approach where I, I still do a lot of telemedicine, um, but I have an office. And I think maybe it was my specialty. People want to feel like you know, my cardiologist needs to listen to my heart. So part of it was that, but, but I think also at the time I was launching, people just really wanted to, to see me in person. And so once I launched that in-person approach, it really shot up, obviously my expenses significantly. Mm -hmm. Um, but I got a lot busier, like almost instantly. So, um, so I think, you know, my model changed. So maybe sitting down and thinking about, you know, trying to project what you want your model to be and, and definitely, you know, your prices will need to reflect what your expenses are and having overhead here in San Francisco is really expensive. Um, and once you get busier, you will need help. Like, I think you just, everyone's going to need to price in at least a virtual assistant, if not more, um, medical malpractice is pretty expensive. Um, all you're Correct. seeing like that's expensive. Anytime you travel to go to a conference, unless you're, you know, being reversed in some way that that gets really expensive. So the, your CPA, your lawyer, you know, all those things like trying to really, and then marketing, I did not budget in marketing. Um, I think I kind of thought, you know, oh, I'm yeah, really active on social media, like all this stuff, marketing and marketing becomes, a, I think a big part of your budget, especially at first. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't budget all that in. So, um, and then I think we as physicians sort of were like, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to be on a, a network. So I got to price myself accordingly. And I'm a doctor, I'm helping people. I need to just, you know, so I think I'm like, you know, we need to think of ourselves as like lawyers, you know, and I still have a very hard do time doing this. And I'm still really very much thinking through all of how much I should be charging and for what. Um, and so I started out with my new patient visit at like $300. That was not a, that was very way too low. Like there was no way I was ever going to even pay myself a salary on that. So, um, so I am now at $600 for a new patient. Um, and that includes, you know, the hour visit with the patient. It all also includes my time reviewing the records ahead of time and then care coordination afterwards. So I still, for my market, every time I meet any other doctors, they're like, wait, what? That's how much you're charging. So I'm still priced a little bit too lowly for my low for my specialty. Um, so I'm working on, on that. I also currently don't charge for portal messaging and things like that. And, and that is going to have to change because it's getting a little out of control. I get a lot of messages. So, um, and I, you know, I really, I didn't want to like nickel and dime my patients and things like that. But I, again, I think everyone, you know, my patients themselves who are lawyers and accountants and such, they're like, no, 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 you need to be charging for this doctor. <laughs> Ooh. Like the number of times I've gotten messages, like, by the way, charge me for this message from my patients who are, you know, businessmen and such. I, I get emails from my patients about like my business model and why I need to start charging more. So, so once you start hearing that from your patients, I think that's also helpful, right? Because they see your value and they're like, whoa, you need to be charging more for this. So, um, so I think don't be afraid of charging kind of what you think you're worth right away based on what your expenses are going to be. And, you know, you want to earn some sort of doctor type salary. Right. So, um, and, and patients will respect that, you know, as long as you're offering value, um, you know, which essentially is your time and knowledge, um, for many of us, like my patients are just, they come to me and they're like, even just for second opinions that aren't really in my preventive niche, they're just like, I had 10 minutes with the doctor. I still don't understand what's going on. Can you just like review everything and talk me through it? And like, they just want to understand, you know, what's going on. And so even just providing that hour to just let them make sure they understand everything is really, really, really valuable, I think. Um, and people, people will pay for it because they pay more money for their plumber and their, you know, de designer and, you know, all these other services, right? Do you charge a fee for service or do you charge a membership model? What's your business? So that's the uh, other strategy. Thing. Great question. And something I'm still working through. I started out with just 
you know, fee for service, trading my time for money. Um, that's still the predominant approach that I have. I am increasingly trying to transition into more of a membership based model. Um, and so I think the challenge that I be, because I really love providing that value in between appointments and I do provide it, but I'm not currently being re reimbursed for it. And so I think um, there's not really a lot of an incentive for my patients to join the membership. Correct. Right. There just isn't. So I have a handful that are, um, I launched that not that long ago. So I'm sort of seeing how that goes. And as new patients come in, I'm presenting it from the beginning. These are your two options. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I need to wean off all my other patients from the portal messages. And I think the best way to do that is if you're not in the membership, there is a fee for, for portal messages. And then, you know, we can, and then I'll just sort of see how that goes. Um, I personally have a lot of people that, that are now referred to me. So we can talk about, um, you know, how patients are finding me at this point, but I do have a decent amount of my practice that's referral based. And many of them come from uh, direct care internists and concierge internists. So they're already paying a monthly fee. Um, and so sort of my feeling was they might not want to pay another monthly fee. And so I what always, I feel like I need to always have that sort of fee for service where they can just kind of pay as they go. Um, but then for everybody else who maybe doesn't have an internist that's super accessible, they might want to opt for the membership. And that's, it's particularly good. So the people that are enrolling in it now are people who they know they want to see me frequently. They need a little bit more high, high touch, um, because we're actively working on, you know, weight loss or cholesterol or blood pressure via lifestyle changes. And so they, they recognize they want that like higher touch level of care. Now, the big question from the patient perspective, when they call your office and they want to make an appointment and um, they offer you their insurance, how do you say that you do not take insurance? What is the message that you send out there? And uh, do you do that or your assistant does it? Great question. So I am very upfront on my website. I don't want to waste time with, I know that there's two schools of thought with this. Um, personally, I am not in the business of converting people over. If they want to go and use their insurance base, if they're happy with an insurance based model, they're not my people. So I'm totally fine with that. I still get a lot of calls. So I think, you know, as long as you're very clear of how on your website, you are different than an insurance based model, then you are by definition going to attract people who um, who are not satisfied with the status quo and they want more, or they like your certain approach. So a lot of people find me because either they want more time with their cardiologist or, and, or they really want someone who's going to not just prescribe a pill for every ill, ill right away. Right. Trust me, I prescribe a lot of medications. Almost all my patients are on, you know, some cholesterol or medicine, but they know that when I'm recommending that it's because we've done all the things we can do lifestyle wise. And we think it's, you know, indicated and it's a, you know, a joint decision anyway. So I tend to attract a lot of those types of patients. Um, so everybody knows very clearly, I think when they're calling the office that I don't take insurance, the only times we sometimes get calls is just straight, straight through Google. So they haven't even gone to the website and they're just like, Hey, I'm looking for a cardiologist. And almost all those people are not the right fit. Um, so I let my assistant handle that because she answers the, the phones. Um, and if they ask straight away, you know, do you take insurance? She'll say, no, and we're an out of network doctor. This is what she does. And if those people are like, Oh, I'm looking for an in-network doctor. Fine. You know? Um, so I, I have enough, like my meet and greets at this point are scheduled out for like a month basically. And I do, I mean, yesterday I did like five meet and greets. Most days I'm doing a handful of meet and greets at least. So I'm, I'm getting a lot of calls and those are set up not to convince people that out of network is the way to go or like all of them, when they're doing that, they already know that. So they mm -hmm. just want to kind of get a better sense of who I am. And so I still do provide those. And I do think those are really powerful. So these are for people who are interested, but they just, they just want to like get a little, a vibe check, if you will. You know what I mean? They just want to make sure yes. that what you're offering is what they're looking for. They want to get a little bit more. I don't get into a lot of the logistics on my website. I try to keep it kind of clean. So a lot of times they're like, okay, how do you work? And so I walk them through sort of how my consultation goes, that they upload this stuff beforehand. This is how much it costs. This is your options going forward. You know, some of the nitty gritty logisticals questions. And then also they kind of just want to meet you beforehand. If they're going to pay out a network, they want to kind of know that they, that you're worth it. Right. And so it's kind of, of course, you offer a little pitch and answer some questions. And I, my conversion rate from my meet and greets is very, very high. So I think once you get good at sort of, and again, I'm not salesy at all. 
take it or leave it. You know, this is me. This is how I work. This is my value. And, and people by and large are like, great, sign me up. So then my assistant calls after that. And um, so my Calendly is set up so that they'll get an email the day afterwards with some of my little uh, Canva PDFs that I've created about, you know, the services are really pretty. And this is the ways you choose different options, things like that. All the contact info for my assistant. If they tell me on the meet and greet, like, I want to see you ASAP, what do I do? Then I'll have my assistant just call them that day and set up the appointment. But if they don't, if they are not decided in the meet and greet, you send them this. It's an automatic thing. So Calendly has a setup where you can have a follow-up email sent out automatically and you can set up when you want that to happen. And I just have it do it the next day. So for people, um, I think it does help people just to one, have that information, but then also that touch point. They also all automatically, once they sign up for a Calendly, all their email addresses automatically go into my MailChimp account. So they also, if they're like not quite sure, they'll get some newsletter from me. Um, So I do a newsletter. (laughs) I try to do it twice a month. I used to do it every week. That was not happening. Twice a month is my goal. It's probably about once a month right now usually either a blog post that a medical Correct. student has helped me write and then I edit them heavily or um, or just like a little blurb. Like I'll just do like my, I was seeing a patient the other day and we talked about this and I thought this was interesting, you know, so I'll, I'll just do kind of a newsy sort of thing like that. So, and more, that's more than anything, just touch points with patients or prospective patients. Um, and I've noticed definitely a good conversion, like anyone that was maybe undecided, once they get that email, they respond to the email and they'll be like, Hey, how do I sign up again? So good. So that's yeah. a, that's a very good strategy. Yeah. So I, that I implemented pretty recently. Um, I was before not capturing those email. I mean, it was just silly. So have Calendly connect your MailChimp or whatever newsletter you're doing. Um, I have two separate newsletters, one for just patients and those that I try to just be pure information, like new services added. Now you can have a membership, this kind of stuff. I try to not inundate them at all. And then my, um, my MailChimp is just for like literally anybody and everybody. So people sign off up off of Instagram, off of Facebook, um, a lot through my newsletter. Um, and then, um, so I think I have about a thousand people on my, on my mailing list right now, which is decent. It's not huge. I don't have, I don't talk about it enough. I probably should talk about it more, but. That is a very good strategy, actually. Um, I did uh, notice the same thing that people that are not convinced in the beginning, they want to watch you, follow you for a certain period of time until they sign up. Now, um, I we will take some questions. I think there are some people here that uh, will be very happy to ask their questions <laughs> and to have your knowledge and expertise share with them. So who who wants to ask a question is welcome to jump in. I think Dominica, uh, you are muted, Dominica. You have to unmute yourself. Hi. Now can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we do. How are you? Excuse my appearance. Um, this is a work from day home. Um, work from home day. Um, I'm an endocrinologist and um, obesity medicine. I'm in Massachusetts where there's really, I feel like, you know, this, this uh, movement is heading east, northeast slowly. Um, So I have a lot of questions, but I'm sure other people do. So do you find, is there an obstacle? I'm not yet in, I'm in private practice. I went into private practice, traditional insurance-based in January of 21. Okay. And I'm still there. And my my practice has exploded, I would say in the last, I don't know, it, it's been gradual, but there's really no endocrine for a very, very large radius ge- geographically right now. So no endocrinologist anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> you can do what you want and you will be busy in a hot second. So you are <laughs> I would say of all the specialties, you are so well positioned. Like, I mean, you're going to be so successful. Like everybody, I mean, I do like CGMs and prediabetes and diabetes, not insulin. I cut, I'd stop there, but like, because there's no endocrinologist anywhere. Anyway, sorry. What are your questions? Sorry, yeah. Well, just, thank you for free. that. I need those free. little, no, it's because it's daunting because I've already done the leap from being employed. I've been in practice for about 17 years total. 
Um, I went, for, I did the leap from being employed to going into, so everything you talked about, starting up a business, all of that, I've done all of that already, but so, so I, you know, that can be an advantage, but in weird ways, it's almost a disadvantage because now I have the very complicated situation where I'm not starting fresh. I'm within, I'm not employed by the large hospital network here in Boston. I'm I'm in network though, very much under contract and in network. And then of course, with the 10 insurances that I take, um, six of which are required for me to stay in, but I won't get into too much of that. I do think that this will be doable and I'm trying to sort of sort through in my mind, do I do this all at once or do I stage it? I'm not sure. I can't, my family can't, I have two youngish daughters and we can't undergo another year or so of no income on my side. You know, um, I do have a hu husband, but you know, whatever our family, we can't, we can't do that again. So that's why I'm particularly just fearful from a financial standpoint, but the, uh, is there an obstacle of like, let's say there's a patient that hears about you and their primary care, you, you know, the whole rules of if they're an in-network of whatever network is where you are, like, that's one of the things I've thought of is when I leave this network, I know a lot of the doctors around here, I know a lot of them, I've been around for a long time, um, but technically they're not supposed to refer to me, I think, although there might be some rules in place where like if you're the only show in town maybe they can bend the rules i know every network is probably different but do you find i mean it sounds like you're not hurting for referrals like not even slightly but even initially where patients or where where local primary care is around not wanting to send patients to you because they weren't supposed to that, no, that's entirely correct. So, um, so one, I don't have any experience, obviously, transitioning from an in-network to out-of-network practice, but there are a lot of people who do. Tia definitely has done that. Connect with her. There's a yeah. couple also direct care endocrinologists that I, on Instagram and stuff like that, follow them, reach out to them. Um, all of them, I, as far as I understand it, are wildly successful. Um, as I said, I think as an endocrinologist, you are going to just be totally fine. So, that aside. Um, and from what I understand, a lot of people do when they're transitioning is they drop just the lowest paying insurers first, yes. um, inform obviously with whatever standard timeline you need to, to inform the patients and you'll lose a bunch of patients. But again, when you're out of network, you don't need as many patients. Like I think my goal is going to be, I mean, what's your goal? I, I, my goal is like around 500 at most. Yeah, I don't even know. I mean, I right now have about 700 patients, but okay. I have literally right now 100 patients waiting. Well, now exactly sort of waiting to see me. My, and, I and have, it depends how often you have to see your patients too. Like I yeah. imagine, I mean, if you're type ones or like, I'm sure there's a lot of people you have to see pretty frequently, particularly at first and stuff like that. So you don't need that many patients um, when you're direct care because you don't have a biller. You don't have, you know, all these other people and this, all this other stuff and all this other administrative burdens, your costs do go down. You don't need as many patients. And then you charge whatever you think you need to charge. Um, and I think as far as I understand it, endocrinologists do very well in a membership model, which again is very helpful. Um, and I really kind of wish I would have started just in membership. Uh, I think you'd grow slower, but I think a good way to do it would be to drop some of your lowest payers and start launch a membership and kind of see, see how all that goes. You definitely, my experience is the people you want to network with that will refer to you for me and my experience has not been a traditional primary care doctor in a traditional practice. Like, so Sutter, UCSF, traditional PCPs, they're not going to refer to me. They just aren't because they either have to refer within their network or they're afraid to bring up the out of network thing and like whatever. So I wouldn't even waste your time there. Um, I would talk to you. So any direct care, like, you know, DPC or concierge style, honestly, the concierge style people are my best preferers um, because their patients um, are used to paying out of pocket. Um, and uh, I mean, they, I think they like that I give super bills. So I think that's helpful. Um, and, um, and so they're, they're just, it's a different sort of there. You don't have to explain the model to them. Like they already get it. Um, 
And their patients, you know, by, by definition, just want more time with their doc, right? They're, they're used to that. And so they're a little taken aback when they then go to, you know, Stanford to see a cardiologist and they're like, wait, what? I got 10 minutes, you know, when they're used to seeing their doctor for like an hour. So, um, so their patients are really grateful for, for that type of service. So the concierge docs and then the non-doctor healthcare people. So nutritionists, you know, acupuncturists, um, who else refers to me? Um, so to kind of talking to like all of those sort of health um, care people that aren't doctors, I think is really helpful. Um, who else? And then, you know, marketing. So marketing is something you'll have to do that you probably don't do a lot of now or you might not do as much of. So marketing becomes more like a part of your budget and more things you do. Pod, local podcasts, radio stations, um, like I said, social media, like that kind of stuff. And that, and that you have the advantage of, you know, you've been in the community for a while and people know you. Um, yeah. and I think that was not our, our situation. We both just like <laughs> moved. And so we we're like, what? and it was deep pandemic. I couldn't, I mean, no one was interested in me coming to an office and like dropping off business cards. Like you weren't supposed to be in the office unless we had to be. So now I feel like that's over. And so, you know, going into all kinds of different, you know, um, you know, offices or health, healthcare places, what health and wellness spaces where you can just drop off your, your, your card and stuff. Um, Yeah. I think all of those things will be great, but yeah, I, I, I get the, the hesitation. I'm, I'm in a place where I'm not the primary bed runner. And so I've had a little bit of a runway, although I think it's like, <laughs> my husband was like, you only have so long here, let's go. Um, but, uh, you know, I think for, so for me, it was slow growth was okay. And definitely direct care. I think you do grow slower because you're not getting sent in these insurance referrals, but for you, you know, you could figure out whatever hybrid approach you wanted to do and seeing how that, go that goes. And you may be surprised, you know, depending on what you charge that people might not leave you if they love you. And I have yeah, to agree 100% here. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's been, that's been a consideration just, yeah, the pricing thing. I'm sure I'm going to do what everybody else does and I'm totally going to low ball. You'll but... totally start too low. I know. <laughs> That's okay. You know, you start. That's that's the most important thing. Yeah. Anybody else that has a question Thank you. for Nicole? Thank you. Thank you, Dominica. And I wish you were in California. I need a director and a chronologist. I mean, that's <laughs> there is none here. Yes. There's none. None. Correct. And I keep getting and I and again, I can manage some of that stuff, but I'm not gonna do thyroid. I'm not gonna do the hormones. I'm not, you know, like. I can do some pre IVs, and that's that's about where I stop. And so people are like, "Where I need another? I want an endocrinologist that's you, but an endocrinologist." Like, and I'm like, eh, "I'm trying." So anyway, actually, there is one in California. She's in Fresno. Uh, uh -huh. Dr. Makia, Dr. Makija. Yes, she is uh -huh. in Fresno, California. So you can refer to her. I should Fresno. I don't know how. Yeah, like but that's should... okay. She can do telemedicine. Tele. Yeah. Anybody else with a question? I have a question. Hi. Hi. Hey, thank you. This is i uh, I'm Dr. Perry. I'm in Kansas city. Uh, I'm a pulmonary and sleep physician. I do all age groups. Um, I was uh, educated to get on social media. I'm very similar to you. It's not my wheelhouse. Uh, I did it anyway. <laughs> um, and so uh, I was told, you know, you have to focus on your niche, which I did. Um, but I got the impression from you, are you actually able to get education in, in 90 seconds? So are you, I mean, I did, you know, I did my typical, you know, night terrors or sleep paralysis or whatever in 90 seconds. So that's really what you're doing. And how often are you posting? So, yes. So I, I try to post a couple times a week. Um, it depends on right now. I mean, I would say this week I posted once, so I've not been that great about it, but whatever it is, what it is, I post when I have time. Um, but I would say three or four times a week is a really good goal, particularly when you're starting out. Um, I think the key for the educational post is trying to pick a topic that you can cover in 90 seconds. That's like my, and I think all of us doctors, we want to be comprehensive, right? And you don't right. have to. And so, so picking just, you know, even the lists are really good. Like my top three tips for blah, blah, blah. And you're not going to be able to go into all of it. And then the bonus is in your stories, you can add more if you want, like check out my stories for more, 
or you can refer to older posts that you've done that encapsulate it. Um, you know, I do think for this reason, I keep meaning to, but I haven't yet is, and you have this, a YouTube channel where you can have longer form content. And I think for doctors, we're, I mean, I like to talk. I feel like I need to, you know, cover the topic A to Z. And if I haven't, you know, so I think YouTube for that reason, it also has better SEO, um, is a great way to, to kind of put out the longer form content if you really want to cover a topic in depth. But I think for social media, yeah, I try to do like snippets, like think of, you know, I'm not going to cover how to lower your cholesterol in like comprehensively, but I can say my top three tips for it. Right. So if you think of it like that, like list formats, um, people and people like those people like the little lists. Um, I try to do that. Or if you get a question, that's another great one. I'll, I've started doing that a lot. Um, your patients will ask questions in the, in the reels and you can actually use that as a, a prompt. And so, and sometimes those are more like specific, like what's a good HRV, you know, and what does that mean? And so I'll do a very specific, like quick little blurb and it's a good challenge and it's good practice because, you know, in the clinic, you obviously, you know, so it's like delivering that like little blurb if you can. So, um, so that's what I would say for that. And then there's different ways to deliver the content too. So reels are huge right now, although, you know, the algorithm goes back and forth, but I love to do also little Canva slides. And I have a, a med student who helps me with that. And you can just do the swipes, the little like slide things. So you can do like five or six slides and then you can provide a little bit more information in the caption as well. And it's crazy mm. that people read them, but they do and they love it. Mm. Um, mm. So you can kind of create content that way too. Okay. So you think and reels are more valuable than uh, the written content? For a period of time, yes. Like when 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 Instagram was trying trying to compete with TikTok, re they were pushing reels, and that's actually when I went from, you know, like I quickly grew from like ten thousand followers to twenty thousand followers, and then all of a sudden, you know, I just kept posting reels, and then I was just like doubling my followers for a while. So there was a period of time where Instagram was really pushing reels. I think they still do ish. But then all of a sudden now they were like, oh, pictures are back. So I think variety <laughs> of content. And then I know I, I don't keep up with that stuff. There are, by the way, if you really want to, um, there's some Instagram like content creator expert people that keep up with all this stuff. Um, who's the guy that, oh, Brock Johnson. So he's like an Instagram coach or whatever. Anyway, Ooh. so I do follow him and every now and then I see his stuff and he'll give you little tidbits. So I sometimes think about, listen to him and do some of that stuff, but I try, I kind of just go with the flow. And the one reason, the other thing I do like reels for is you can repurpose it very easily. And I've actually found that, um, so I never, I was not on TikTok for a while. I was like, I'm a cardiologist. My people are not on TikTok, but <laughs> my med student was like, why don't I just repost it to TikTok? And like, people are liking it. I haven't posted that much on there, but, um, but it's not any work, right? It's not extra work. So you can repost to TikTok. There are some doctors that are blown up on TikTok. So it is, you know, I think if you create, especially if you're doing like any hormonal health stuff, thyroid right. stuff, like, like, all, you, like as an endocrinologist, by the way, you would do very well on TikTok. Um, so, so people, so TikTok is great. And then I actually repost my reel to my Facebook and I started growing on Facebook, which is where I've always assumed my people were. Um, and so I'm finally kind of growing on Facebook where I hadn't been when I was just doing like, you know, regular static posts. Cause I don't even know how people find you on Facebook anymore, but reels they're trying to push too. So, um, so re so you can repost it in three places. And then actually, if you have a YouTube channel, which I haven't done yet, you can do YouTube shorts there. So creating one piece of content, you can put it a poster across four different platforms. Another quick question. Um, I have tried to go on the cheap. Uh, I was, I was naive, like, um, you know, a lot of folks thinking that, you know, people would follow me, people would find me. I've been in the area for 30 years. Um, I also am only renting space because I didn't want to go into debt. Um, I am seeing people in person half day a week in telemedicine, but, um, and I have a really good website. We did pay up front for that. And I, I am, am adding a video to educate people about DSC because I am really passionate about the philosophy. But what, what would anybody say about, I've been hesitant to spend another several thousand dollars on advertising, but you know what, at this point, I've been doing this for a year and I'm still not seeing a lot of patients. And I'm like, okay, I've got to put some money out there to make some money. 
Yes. And I, we all struggle with this. I'm super cheap by nature. Like I am, I'm very cheap. So I, that was a hard concept for me. And I heard that phrase over and over. I'm like, yeah, but, and it, it is true. I have seen, so I ended up hiring um, someone to do marketing for me. It is a huge, huge part of my budget right now um, because he's expensive and then spent, you know, just if you want your dollars to go anywhere on like Google ads, for instance, you do have to spend like real money. Um, so I was pretty hesitant for a while. Um, what I would say is the best return on my personal investment has been hitting the payment and networking, bringing business cards, any health related industry, gyms, nutritionists, facialists, all the different docs you can think of, like just going to all the offices, making sure people know you're there, participating in other events. Like, and it's not, it does not come naturally to me either. I don't, I love to talk, but like putting myself out there was hard. So I would say if you haven't like super, super hit the payment and like literally handed out your business cards, like candy to everyone do that first. Cause that's free. Um, basically. Um, but marketing, yes, I, I have seen a pretty good return on my investment. Um, so I hired someone, we, I would say the first two or three months, I was like, what am I doing? I'm spending almost $3,000 a month and I'm getting nothing from this. And I almost stopped. Um, but, but so it takes some time for like, whatever the algorithms to learn who to send your ad to. Um, he started with both Facebook ads and, and Google ads. I pulled the Facebook ads pretty quickly. I did not see any return on investment for that. I agree. Um, yeah. I think they're useful. Yeah, the same here. For our, I think if you were selling a lipstick, Facebook ads work well for like a high price point service. I don't think they do well. So, uh, but I have seen a really good return on investment with Google ads. And I think you have to spend enough money to see it. But once you do, so I'm currently... I started out by spending 2000 a month on just Google ads and then his fee. Um, and I'm now, I told him the, I, a couple of weeks ago to cut it down because I'm too busy. Um, so I'm now spending about a thousand dollars a month on Google ads. Um, and it's not nothing. It's a lot. I, like I said, it is a really right now, a big part of my budget, but like you, I think, you know, especially if you're attracting the right patient, you know, however much you spend on those ads, like, I mean, so if I'm spending now a thousand dollars a month on ads plus him, so $2,000 a month, you know, if my price, if I get even just a couple of patients from that per month, and if even just two of them decide to follow with me, like that pays for itself. So, yeah, I need to bump my price up. I'm paying, I'm charging two fifty for a 60 minute appointment at this point. Of course I live in the middle of Kansas city. So and I hear you and that's hard, right? So like my, your rent is probably very different than, than my rent, but at the same yes. time, paradoxically, you may see pe one, people don't care that much. Like if it's 250 versus 300, but for you, that change really is a big difference. Um, so you could start slow like that and see what happens. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you have to do what's obviously the numbers. We can talk numbers and I think we should, but I think for every, you know, each of us, it's going to be very different what that means. I mean, my right, right. Is insane, you know, like I, I was looking at a new space and I was like, because <laughs> right okay. now I have a really small space. I'm rent. It's, it's like 500 square feet, but as is, it's a massive part. I mean, literally the only two things I spend money on is marketing and my rent. Um, and yeah. so I was trying to find just a slightly bigger space and oh my goodness, friends, I don't know how I'd like how I would ever afford it. So um, that, that's true. Those are the big, uh, big expenses that you have to realize that you have to have and malpractice insurance, malpractice insurance is going to eat a lot of the money that yeah. you make. Um, those are the three things. But until you understand that marketing is important, because it took me a while to understand too. And if you get three, four patients from the Google ads, it's going to pay back mm -hmm. what you actually yeah. uh, spend. And those patients will bring the word forward to other people. And that's the part that we don't understand because they need the entrance to us. But once they got the to experience uh, the medical care that you provide, they will take that forward and they will be mm -hmm. your best advocates. And that's, you know, organic yeah. growth. Somebody yeah. else is asking here if we have recommendations for a marketing company. I have recommendations for the people that I work with. I tried many 
it's not easy to find someone that really knows what they are doing. A lot of them, they will sell you the dreams that you want to hear. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, not many of them uh, know this business of Google Ads. And until you understand that you are competing, doesn't matter that you pay the money, your ads are competing to others and your ads has to be done so well to target your person, then you're not going to um, have success. We will let Nicole go because um, it's almost uh, the time of one hour. If you have a message for the physicians that are considering direct care, Nicole, please. I, I just feel like we can all do this. We all need to do this. And, you know, I'm part of whatever private practice Facebook group, the regular one. And all I see are people talking about how horrible the insurance companies are, how much they rip us off, how much less we get paid um, compared to a hospital based practice. I also see how much the hospitals are charging my patients for studies and for things like that, even with their insurance. And I mean, my mind is blown. So I think this is the way that private practice will remain a thing. And I think without it, private practice is just going to go away. Um, and so I think for, for doctors to maintain any sort of autonomy, this is the way to go. And, you know, I am still building, I am still learning, but I probably work harder than I ever did in an employed private practice model, but it's mine. It's my baby. I'm happy about it. And it's pretty cool. Like the feedback that you get from patients about being like, wow, this is so different. Like, you know, the other day I was like, you know, I had a patient be like, you are exactly what I've been looking for. Like, where have you been? You know? And so I think, you know, we owe it to our patients to, to really put ourselves out there. Um, so if you're thinking you can't do it, you can. I feel like I'm the least business heavy person out there. I'm like my, for personal finances, I let my husband deal with it all. Um, but you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Thank you, Nicole. This was a great energy, great talk. I really appreciate your sharing your story. And thank you to everybody that took the time to be here with us. I'll see you soon. Bye. Absolutely. Thank you. See ya. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.